Welcome to the Art of Skill podcast, episode six. I'm your host, Rick Ellis. Today's guest is Ty Gay. Ty is the 13th American Black Belt awarded from the Gracie Academy in Torrance, California. He's also the former singer in a touring band called Everybody Panic, and more recently, he's become an advocate for victims of sexual abuse in jiu-jitsu and is currently working on a documentary on the subject. Stay tuned. The Art of Skill podcast is brought to you by Element Electrolyte Drink Mix. If you're an athlete, you need to be paying attention to your electrolytes for optimum health, performance, and recovery. Element comes in a variety of great flavors. Each packet contains sodium, potassium, magnesium, and no sugar or artificial junk. Just add a packet of Element to your water bottle and you're good to go. We have an exclusive offer for fans of the Art of Skill podcast. Get a sample pack mailed to you for the price of shipping. For more information, visit drinkelement.com slash theartofskill. That's drinklmnt.com slash theartofskill. Stay salty, my friends. Joining me today on the podcast is Ty Gay. Hey, Ty, how's it going? Great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so good to see you. I um, wanted to get you on the podcast, not only because you and I have a bunch of stuff in common. Both of us are jujitsu black belts. We're both musicians, although I call myself a recovering musician these days. Not completely <laughs> recovered. I don't know if you can ever be totally recovered, but we have that in common. And also because you have a really important cause that you've been putting a lot of energy into, and that is the subject of sexual abuse in the world of jujitsu. And even though we have a great sport and it's, I think, mostly pretty clean, um, you know, there are some problems out there. And you, to your credit, are um, being really proactive about this and you, you've made it a cause of yours and you're even doing a little film. There's a documentary that I, I hear you've started production on. So that's really cool. And I thought it would make a great conversation for the channel. So I appreciate you coming on today. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, um, it's not a. It's not really a feel good story, but it's a story that needs to happen nevertheless. Yeah. Let's we'll circle to that story. I, I want to start with some some other things. Maybe we'll talk about jujitsu. Maybe we'll talk about your music uh, because sure. that's a subject that's near and dear to my heart for sure. In fact, I could just talk about that alone for the next couple hours and probably not exhaust it as a fellow musician. But <laughs> let, let's let's start with the, that. The, the, let, we'll start with the light stuff. And yeah, then, and then we'll get to the other stuff. So you are the 13th black belt awarded by uh, the Torrance Academy in California, Huron right. and Henry Gracie. Lucky 13. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> yep, that's right. I am the seventh black belt under Roy Dean. So I think between the two of us, we could awesome. go to the uh, the roulette tables in, in Las Vegas and probably do that's pretty That's awesome. Well. <laughs> I love Roy, man. Uh, he's a musician too, you know, so yeah. that's, that's super cool. Yeah, that's awesome. That, you know, when I met Roy, he he was uh, a brown belt, and he mm. came up to Oregon to teach a little seminar to a group of guys that I was part of. We were trying to teach ourselves jujitsu. It was a, some guys at a Taekwondo academy that on Thursday nights would would use their space to to grapple a little bit. And um, <clears throat> so, at one point, I'm sitting on the mat, and Roy says. Or no, I, I asked her, I'm like, so, so what do you do? And he goes, well, I'm a sound designer in San Diego. And I'm like, oh, really? I used to be a sound designer and a recording engineer in LA. So, you know, that started off the friendship and the, the creative awesome. collaboration and all that stuff. And, and, uh, yeah, that's super cool. There is, yeah, a creativity. Actually... Mm, go ahead. No, it's fine. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that there is something, you know, I find jujitsu to, to be an immensely creative sport, martial art outlet. And I find a lot of parallels with that creativity in music. I don't know if you see that yourself. I assume you do. Oh yeah, um, for sure. What kind of stuff do you see there? Well, you know, the whole thing of it's, it's an artistic expression. We're dealing with the issue of timing. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very much, well, and I guess it's because I am a musician that I kind of relate everything to music. But yeah, I mean, the, 
how I got started in jujitsu is I was backstage at a Tool concert and the singer of Tool, this guy named Maynard, had this mm-hmm. big yoked Asian guy standing next to him, was his bodyguard. I walked up to him and was like, I know you do some kind of martial art. What is it? I'll never forget. He stood up off his chair. He, he crossed his arms, pushed out his neck. He said, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. And um, UFC 4 had just happened a little bit earlier than that in Oklahoma. And so I saw Hoist choke out Dan Severin and stuff. And I was like, wow. Anyway, that yoked up Asian guy was Henry Akins. And Henry Akins is, you know, yeah. pretty well-known black belt under Hicks and Gracie now. But uh, yeah, that's how I got my start in Jiu-Jitsu. He was getting dropped off of the tool tour here in Oklahoma. And he stayed here because it was around Christmas time. You know, most tours stop around Christmas. And so he got to come here to see his family. So he came over to my house and we trained for like a week or so. He was a blue belt. So he showed me like, you know, Gracie. Which was pretty impressive. In those days, a blue belt was like, wow. A purple belt was a purple belt was a unicorn. (laughs) That's right. That's right. I remember when Lovato and his dad got their blue belts, it was in the paper. And so I still got that paper with them getting their blue belts. It was a big deal, you know. So, but yeah, it's. Music and jiu-jitsu, for me, are completely intertwined. In fact, we, me and Henry just got through uh, going out to Maynard's school over a Memorial Day weekend. We went out there and stayed with Maynard at his house and his little ranch and stuff and trained and, you know, talked shop and stuff. So music and nice. jiu-jitsu is very much intertwined for me. Yeah, it's funny about the thing about jiu-jitsu is it breaks down barriers between people that might not normally run in the same circles. You might not normally be friends with that person or, or whatever, but... There's just something about the honesty, the intensity, and the, you know, the instant friendship you develop with someone when you bump fists. And it doesn't matter what walk of life they're from. It, it's just a connecting thing, which is very, very special. I, I completely agree. My coach, Hedon Gracie, would say that rolling with somebody is like going out to eat dinner with them four times. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's you're pretty close it, to those people. Yeah, it's a shortcut to the normal, you know, there's a normally a process, um, a social process to get sure. getting to know someone. And it just, you, you don't even have to know their name. Sometimes you, you become friends with someone and you still haven't known, you know, bro, what, what's your name again? <laughs> you know? It's true. <laughs> it, it's a pretty funny thing. Um, yeah, the music thing is, you know, I find so many parallels uh, on a lot of levels. One is that, in music, there are only 12 notes. And it's the assembly of those notes, the harmonic assembly, the rhythmic assembly that determines what style of music it is, and, and so on. And, you know, and there's only so many ways to manipulate a joint, right? Joints only work in certain certain ways. So there's not that many ways to choke someone or to break their bones. But yet, there are hundreds of, of ways that we do that in jujitsu. And so it's the assembly of those components that defines your game or that defines my game. And, and they're different games, just like different musical expressions. I like blues. You might like raw, you know, whatever. Yeah. And uh, so that's one way to look at it is that there's a creative assembly there and it's very much um, just sort, sort of like music. It's your, how you see the world, your influences, your body type, your mentality. Are you aggressive? Are you mellow? It all comes out on the mat expressed in that way. Hundred percent. Yeah, we actually have quite a few musicians at our academy. It's interesting the mix that we have between like first responders, federal agents, and musicians. It's like you said, you would never have that group of people in the same room together most mm-hmm. of the time. But it's like you know, best of friends when we're there at the academy. So it's a it's a cool experience to experience other people in their different walks of life. But we all have the common thread of jujitsu, which is pretty cool. Yeah. So it sounds like you're more of a 90s musician in terms of your influences. I could be wrong oh, on yeah. that. I think you're, you're a little younger than me. Your, your yeah, band. 46. You're 46. Yeah, you're, we're, I'm about a decade ahead of you, So, which <laughs> makes me more of an 80s. I was playing in bands in the late 80s, early 90s. I was playing awesome. in rock bands. So my musical influences are more, you know, anything that had cool guitar and cool vocals I was into, whether it was... Um, you know, 80s metal, whether it was 80s sort of new wave, as long as it had cool guitar, you know, Billy Idol, that sort of thing, or U2, Red Hot Chili Peppers, um, King's X was my jam. I loved that. Oh, yeah. And and then some of the early 90s stuff, a little bit of Pearl Jam, Blind Melon. um, Oh, man, there's so many, you know, you have to go back into the vault and think of all those bands. But it sounds to me like I was 
ending my music career as a musician, as I was transitioning to becoming an audio engineer, when you were kind of mm-hmm. coming into your musical, you know, persona. Yeah, yeah it's, it's true. And it's, it's pretty cool, like, how many touring musicians train jiu-jitsu now. You know, it's like, uh, again, Maynard obviously trains yeah. jiu-jitsu, but then... Uh, um, you get Zoltan from Five Finger Death Punch. That's how I got on that tour was he was a jiu-jitsu guy and ended up uh, the, one of the bands canceled when they played Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I hit him up and I uh, was like, hey, you know, let my band open the show. We opened the show. And then afterwards, he was like, you want to go finish the tour? <laughs> I was like, oh, yes. Nice. <laughs> so that's kind of I got that gig. But then there's like Billy from uh, Biohazard. He's black belt in jiu-jitsu. You get Matt Heafy from Trivium. He's a brown belt. Um, and there's a uh, map from crowbar. I mean, there's all sorts of guys that are jujitsu guys that are, you know, touring musicians. I think that's really cool. It's better than just doing P 90 X or something backstage, you know? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's such a, it's interesting. And again, it's that create creative, um, you know, there's a creativity to jujitsu and certain people get it, you know, and I'm sure you get it too. You, you know, when you, you see guys will walk into the dojo, they've never trained jujitsu before. And some people, they don't quite get it, but to those that sort of, they get it, you know, either they're nerds, they're programmers, sometimes they're creative types, you know, they're able to see the world a little differently. Maybe they're not so linear in their thinking and yeah. jujitsu just becomes this, this thing that they look at as something they can unlock and it can become a creative expression as well. I agree for sure. Seen it a lot. Been running my school since 2004, so I've seen every walk of life come through there, you know. Yeah. And you know the the whole thing of like jujitsu saved my life. You know, that's you hear that over and over again from so many different people that find jujitsu just at the right time where it makes a big impact and you know a, a good positive shift in their life. And I think that's just awesome. Yeah, for sure. You know, so you're from Oklahoma, and there wasn't a lot of jujitsu in Oklahoma back in the day. And, and you, you mentioned Lovato. Mm-hmm. and who's your neighbor down, down the road. For sure. uh, and it sounds like his, his journey and your journey were in some ways kind of similar in that in those days you had to seek out the knowledge. You had to either go to the knowledge or you had to buy, you know, instructionals wherever they were available, which weren't a lot, or you had to bring yeah. guys in. So tell me about, you know, how, how that journey yeah. was for you as someone that, you know, you, you, it wasn't like you could just go to a school and train under somebody. It's true. Yeah, so I would fly out of California and go train with Henry at Hickson's Academy and stuff um, as much as I possibly could in the early days. And they told me, you know, because there was no jiu-jitsu schools. Even Carlos Machado wasn't in Texas yet, so there was yeah. there was nobody around. And they were like, listen, you need to go find a good judo school and just train there. So I found this guy named Pat Burst, who's an Olympic judo guy who had a, a program here in Oklahoma. He also taught Japanese jiu-jitsu, which... Some Japanese jiu-jitsu is kind of like, uh, oh, I don't know, kind of more traditional Japanese style. But they were doing like, <laughs> it was called NHB at the time. So we were doing like cage fighting type stuff early on. Really? And they were calling it combat jiu-jitsu. And so we would get in there and we would, you know, still punch and kick but do submissions and stuff. So it was very similar to what you see the Gracies doing in the early 80s and stuff. So, um yeah, it was fascinating. Frank Trigg trained with us. Uh, Evan yeah. Tanner was training with us back then. Um, so we had some pretty solid guys in there. And, and back then, you talk about getting instructionals. I think because Century Martial Arts is actually located in Oklahoma. And so uh, I would go scour through their VHS tapes because it was all VHS back then. There was yeah. no uh, YouTube back then. So I would scour through there, and I found, like, Joe Marrera. I found him yeah. doing, like, an instructional thing. And that was like the very first one that Century carried. So, of course, I got his black belt one first and then brown belt and all the way down to white belt because I was like, oh, I don't understand any of this. Uh, But, yeah, it was very hard to get information back then. And then um, luckily Henry, because he lived in California but his family lived in Oklahoma, he would come in for holidays, birthday things and stuff like that. So I got to see him like once or twice a year for 20 
four or five years. And back then, uh, Hickson was pretty coveted with his techniques and stuff. And so Henry couldn't really say he was teaching me. He wasn't really supposed to show Hickson stuff. Yeah. But he would come over and show me stuff. And then I would go back to my judo uh, school, USA Stars. And people would be like, where would you learn that? I'd be like, I don't know, but made it up because <laughs> I didn't want to out Henry, you know. And so and he always showed me stuff. And I used it as like a secret weapon my whole life. Um Henry is actually the guy that told me to go to the Gracie Academy to get my black belt because it just looks better. They're the first academy, you know, and um, mm -hmm. Horion, you know, brought jiu-jitsu to America. And so it was a very cool journey. Um, I'm still training with Henry. Um, we still have him in like every three months at my school. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm just I'm very blessed to have had the yeah. life and uh, experiences that I've had. But in the beginning, yeah, it was a lot harder to get information. People don't realize, like, how easy they have it now. People can yeah. literally go to any town just about in America and find a jiu-jitsu school. Yeah. That was just crazy talk back in the day. And we thought that it was going to go completely away because it was getting, you know, UFC was getting de deemed a blood sport and taking it off pay-per-view. And I was like, uh-oh. it's Human cockfighting. Remember John McCain? He tried to outline. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. So um, we're lucky that the UFC turned into what it did because it really obviously pushed jiu-jitsu to where it's at today. And, you know, every year it gets a little bit better. These new um, tournaments like, you know, Fight to Win Pro and uh, all these different ones that you – know, Metamorphs really started that. You know, when Metamorphs yeah. came along was trying to do that thing like that. That format was really cool. And that started to just generate more eyeballs watching it and stuff. And I do think that no gi is going to become a little bit more prominent in the future just because UFC fans can watch it and understand it. And, um, you know, UFC is almost as popular as football is now in America, which is crazy. Yeah. So, um, well, and I'm fine with that. The no gi yeah. game rewards athleticism, as you know, right? right. In the mm -hmm. gi game, you can slow people down. It's, it's a little more methodical. Um, it's a little bit it's less harder to understand. And it's much harder like, to understand. That, that's yeah. the thing. You have to have a real educated eye. To, to be even be able to watch it and and see yeah. those small movements, those small positional incre in improvements. Whereas with no gi, you know, it's a smaller subset of the game in a lot of ways, and I, I think it does lend itself better. Maybe not entirely. I don't know that it'll ever be a widespread spectator sport because you do have to know what you're yeah. looking at. But it looks more like wrestling, and it's more dynamic, and and so it's got that going for it for sure. Right. Yep. I agree completely. So, so you said you trained at the Hickson Academy in California. Did you ever roll with mm -hmm. Hickson? No. No, I never had the pleasure of rolling with him. Um, I met him a couple of times or whatever, but never uh, never got to roll with the guy. I rolled with Hoxson, um, and he just dismantled me. It's just so funny. I was a blue belt at the uh, judo place in Japanese jiu-jitsu, but I didn't yeah. even wear that when I went out there. I wore a white belt hoping that they would – take it easy on me. Uh, yeah. They beat the brakes off of me. <laughs> it was great, though. I've got pictures. Back then, we were taking it with like a disposable camera, and it literally looked like a step-by-step -step instructional of how to kick my ass if you look at the pictures in a row. <laughs> yeah. I had blue dreads at the time, and that wasn't really helping me because they could, like, you know, pin them to the floor. <laughs> yeah, great. that's funny. So your academy is called Redline, and when you started it, I think your mentality was that you just have to hammer hard. You got to redline yourself. This is how we train. And I think oh, yeah. it was was it um, here on Gracie that maybe began getting you thinking a little bit differently about how to train jujitsu. Or tell tell me that story. Yeah. Um, so. In the beginning, we created Redline. It was really just to get bodies to roll with so we could go do tournaments and stuff. And tournament game wasn't really big back then. It was most of the time held at academies and stuff. So, um, mm -hmm. But we would do like Grappler's Quest and some stuff like that. And so just getting people there. I'll never forget. We had a red bucket with a Redline sticker on it. And uh, I didn't really do any advertising or anything for it because I, I taught like kids gymnastics slash like pseudo karate for like little kids. And that was where my income came from. And the guy was just kind of nice enough to let me use the place after hours. And that's where Redline really started in 2004. And so if you showed up and we let you in, um, my job was to make you throw up in that bucket. <laughs> <laughs> it's like in CrossFit. So, they have pukey the bucket in CrossFit. That's, that's right. Yeah. So can't really keep a good large client base that way. But uh, we were tough, I guess. And so 
that's how it kind of started. And yeah, um, he don't really change things, but really I met Henner first. He came in and did a seminar for me and he came in and he put his feet up on my desk in the office and he goes, what are you trying to do here, bro? I was like, uh, jujitsu. And he was like, asked me some very basic questions. He was like, well, let me ask you this. He goes, do you have a basics class? I was like, mm, no, we just have like somebody that's, if they're new, they come in, we put them with somebody that's more advanced and they kind of, you know, help them along the way. He was like, okay. He goes, let me ask you this. Do you line everybody up against the wall and do angle management or do you have them gather around you in a circle? And I was like, in a circle? He was like, okay. He goes, well, those are the first two things you need to change. Yeah. And I, when I changed that, I saw an immediate improvement in like how I was able to get information to people and then retention because people if you if they don't know what the what to do at all and you just throw them in there to the to the big dogs to be chew toys again they're not going to stay that's just you can only yeah. you can only lose so much without positive reinforcement and it's like okay well i'm gonna try something else you know yeah so you know i've really, trained really in, i've trained in environments where it's real sink or swim and you certainly get tougher um you're defending you a lot if you stay, if you stay, mm -hmm. you, you definitely get tougher, but your jujitsu, it's a long journey to get good at jujitsu because those windows of opportunity are so tiny. You know, you have to dial it back so that you, you can't go from cooperative drilling to a hundred percent intensity and expect that people are going to be able to bridge that gap. And, you know, that's one thing that I learned from Roy. He, he was very big on scaled intensity and mm -hmm. uh, makes a huge difference in people's development. And he, yeah, he exactly. also was where I got the idea of lining people up. And I think that just comes from traditional jujitsu, traditional judo, traditional martial arts, where when you're learning the technique, you are lined up and it is angle management. It allows everybody to see uh, the angle. You can keep adjusting the angle so people can, can, can see it versus a circle. The circles always bug me for a couple of reasons. One is that half the room can't see the technique, but also because it encourages people sort of being off in the distance. The circle is never a tight circle. It's always a loose circle and you get these people on the perimeter and are they even paying attention? You know, so I think there's something about the formality of a line that it engages the mind a, a little more. Um, I agree. Have you you know, what will happen is you'll end up with black belts and brown belts close to the inner circle. And then there's purple belts and blue belts and at the very edges on the outskirts of the white belts that don't even know why they're doing it or what's going on and they don't get any of the information and they're probably the ones that need it the most so mm -hmm. so your wife is a black belt mm -hmm. and she was one of the earliest black belts in oklahoma which yep. is pretty amazing I, i'm trying to think i'm in wyoming and i don't think there are any female black belts in wyoming i don't think i could be wrong but i i don't think there's only a few male black belts uh there's a bunch of females in in colorado the neighboring state uh but mm -hmm. but there's still not a lot of women that commit for the long term to train jiu-jitsu and uh, yeah. i wonder from your perspective why is it so difficult to retain women is it that they're uncomfortable with that close contact is it that because most women are a little weaker, a little smaller, that it's just a, such a long journey to become skilled at jujitsu. Uh, what, what is well, that? Well, yeah, there's several variables. I think, I think one, it's a male dominated alpha male art of fighting. Um, mm -hmm. Women aren't inherent fighters. You know, um, that's mostly men that are like that. But I mean, if you look at who really needs jujitsu probably the most, it would be women and children, right? So, um, there's a very small group. I think that the amount of, and I might be wrong about this, but I think there's only like a thousand black belts that are female in the world. So mm. it's really small. So this, yeah. the, the group of women that are actually training jujitsu is uh, just a fraction of what it is in comparison to the male population that's training. Yeah. Um, and it's rough. Uh, it's, you know, you're close quarters with people it's all uncomfortable positions so i mean there's a myriad of reasons why it would be discouraging to a female to be there on top of all the other problems with like misogynistic coaches or the culture in the gym being just you know gross or whatever so yeah it's a it's a it's a it's a hard road for them and it's super commendable that they've even been able to etch out the amount of space that they have created for themselves in this art um, yeah, I don't think they get enough credit for being yeah. able to do that. 
So it's uh, yeah, and and the thing is, women. It's awesome. You know, it's interesting. I've trained with a lot of women over the years, and in general, women they assimilate technique a little faster than guys. I think, and yeah, I think that women tend to have a better mind body connection. They're able to mm-hmm. sort of internalize how to move a little better than guys. And so I've seen many women become very, very skilled at jujitsu. Sometimes if you're in this environment where you're still a little smaller, a little weaker, even though you're technically, technically skilled, you don't have a big enough gap to overcome the big, strong guys. And so it, from their perspective, they might feel like, wow, I'm just, I'm still not good at this. But from the coach's perspective, you're looking at, you're like, no, you're really internalizing this technique. Well, you're moving really well, you pay attention, you're, you know, all this stuff. And I just think it's such a powerful art for women. You think of all the bad things that can happen out there to women in an assault situation and so on. And she just is the perfect art for that. And I don't know what the solution is is for that. I just know that it's, you know, it's tough to retain students no matter what, Um, you know, it's a, it's a hard, it's a hard art regardless. It's true. It's hard to retain people in general in jiu-jitsu because it's it's hard, and we, our society is a little bit softer than probably it has been in years past. Yeah. And uh, it's you know it's it's difficult uh, to keep just a, a man in there, much less a woman in the same kind of environment. So, um, but I think that as time goes on, we you know we're just like jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu is evolving, and so is our culture. Um, not just in jiu-jitsu, but in society and in, in, in large. So I think that um, I'm, I'm also an optimist. So I believe that there is a, a silver lining or a light at the end of the tunnel to all this stuff. And I think that uh, hopefully jiu-jitsu will become even more inclusive and more refined on how the uh, the structure is set up and how the culture is and all that stuff. So, yeah. I think in, in bigger environments, sometimes schools will have female-only classes and I think mm-hmm. those can be really good. Uh, in one sense, it can be really good. On the other hand, I think that women should be integrated with men because if someone's going to attack a woman, it's going to be a dude. It's not going to be a woman. Uh, so they should be able to deal with that. But I think that female-only classes can be really good because it allows women kind of the to learn and to um, assess where they are technically with other girls that are a more realistic representation of where they're at in the journey. Uh, but in smaller environments, I've got a small academy. It's just, we just don't have enough girls to have a dedicated thing. We don't even have enough students. You, you know, our, our, our school tends to be skewed toward beginners because we're a college town and mm-hmm. everybody leaves this town. There's just a churn to the university. We've got 15,000 students here that they just showed up. And our enrollment goes way up, you know, during the school year, and then everybody leaves. So it tends to be skewed toward beginners. So we just run general classes, which is, um, you know, just the nature of, of the demographic more than that. But um, do, you, do you guys run female only classes? Does your wife run them? Or do you, what do you think um, of that? So she has a, a brand and a like a group called she jitsu and it's a uh, women only and she does uh basically like camps and so mm. well and this is really to get people from outside inside and this is like a feeder program into our co-ed classes yeah. and so she runs that like twice a year typically and then she has some uh women only open mats that we do at our academy where just the girls get up there and do their thing. What's interesting, the dynamic is so much different between women and men. When you have the girls in class, you can always tell because they are constantly laughing. Yes. Yes. (laughs) There's some sort of joke that's going on constantly and they are, it's just hilarious or they'll hit each other in the head on accident and it's the most hilarious thing ever, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Women women are very social. They're very verbal and they very, yeah, very much. So I I noticed the same thing as well. I I did a video with a couple of my female students called um, how to be a, or I think it was called how to be a woman in jujitsu. And we Mm. just talked about some of the challenges and and that video was really well received out, out there, but some of the challenges, even things that, you know, some guys are just awkward. They don't know how to roll with a woman. They, mm-hmm. they either go way, way too light. They think they're going to break the girl or, or sometimes they just smash the girl or they're, you know, sometimes there's just, just, so there's things like that. Or sometimes some women, I think they feel like, 
you know, they're the last one to get picked to partner up. Like the guys want to pair up together and they don't. So there's just a bunch of issues I, I think that are a challenge for women. And, you know, one of the things that one of my females who's been with me for a few years now, and she's got an amazing, just transformative story, but uh, she seeks out female groups. She's got a group of girls. Um, I think it's called girls in geese and they get together oh, yeah. periodically. And, and she's part of these online groups. And I think, probably more than, than for men, for women, it's seeking out other like-minded women that can become a support network uh, of girls yeah. to talk to and, and all that. And it sounds like your wife's doing some of that stuff herself. Yeah. My wife used to be the head of the Girls and Geese chapter here in Oklahoma for many, many mm. years. And Shama is the one that runs that. I love them very much. I did a, uh, um, a live thing with them not very long ago talking about this whole issue with sexual predators and stuff. And so they're really wanting to help out any way that they can. They have a large reach as well. Mm. One of the things that we do here at my academy that has been very successful is um, whenever we start to pair everybody up to roll, I make all of the girls pick first. So they find people to roll with. And it's if they want to roll just with the girls, they can roll with the girls. If they want to pick out the guys to roll with, they can. And then the guys, um, after the girls have already picked who their partners are, then the guys are allowed to go pick all their partners. And um, and the girls will try different partners that they haven't rolled with before. But if you're like a crusher, you know, want to crush girls, um, then they will just start moving away from you. And you'll notice that you never have girls asking you to roll. And that's kind of the indicator that, hey, maybe you're smashing people's faces too much. And if you're rolling too light with the girls at our academy, they'll let you know. They'll be like, hey, you can, you're, it's fine. You know, you can smash me a little more or whatever. And that has really worked fairly well. And then um, the girls don't feel like they're being left out. Um, and the guys don't feel like, you know, awkward about it because they get picked. It's like, okay, well, good, I'm picked. So it's not like them picking the girl to roll with. Yeah. And it, it's made it a little easier. I don't know if it's the answer to everything, but it's it has helped somewhat at my academy. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I, I hadn't heard that approach, but it, it, it sounds like it's useful for sure. So that's probably a good segue. Let's, let's talk about this issue of sexual abuse um, that you, has become... Yeah you know, something real important to you. And I commend you for that. Uh, and, you know, th this is a, a spectrum, you know, I've had to deal with a couple students, a couple male students that have, you know, crossed some lines and, you know, zero tolerance, they're gone. But, you know, sometimes it's not overt. And I think as a coach, sometimes, you know, you can be really vigilant, but it's very hard to see sometimes those nuances. And that's just one component of it then there's the the predatory instructors the the guys that are um you know using their power in, in this way so tell so tell me about this cause how did you how did this um you know become a cause for you and, and all that okay well okay so four years ago um a buddy of mine who's also a black belt under hicks and gracie uh went on his social media on i think facebook and posted a picture of Hickson with this guy and said, you know, Hickson, I can't believe you allow this child molester in your home and all this stuff. And I reached out to him. I was like, what is going on? You know, um, because I started with Henry Akins and I've watched the choke video until I broke the VHS tape. I mean, I, I hold Hickson to pretty high yeah. esteem in there. And he's like Superman to me, you know. Yeah. And uh, so to see like this guy who's been who at the time I was just allegedly was a sexual predator or child molester at his house. I just couldn't believe it. And so I called Henry. I was like, what is going on? He's like, yeah, I tried to talk to Hickson about it, you know, when they had their meeting for the Global Jiu-Jitsu Federation. And I guess it just kind of fell on deaf ears. And, you know, I've been a singer in a band for a long time and I'm kind of a loud mouth. So, uh, and I had a large, a larger social media presence, uh, presence at the time than Brandon Hetzler did. So I went on all my social media stuff and I made a video and I basically called Hickson out. Basically called him a fraud because he was trying to bring back ethics into jujitsu and all this stuff at the time. And well, uh, he released. Like, they released a statement that was, uh, if if yeah. I recall, his his statement was something to the effect of, "Well, this guy did the time. He was cleared. He's not on the, um, what is it, the sexual predator list or the, uh, I forget yeah. the name of it. And he, and so we believe in giving people a second chance and so on and so on. And, and that yeah. wasn't, you, that didn't sit well with you. 
No, nah, nor nor with other people. Um, so they actually released another statement after that, saying that they had decided to take a zero tolerance stance and policy, and they did eventually get David Armbeck out of their association. That's who we were talking about was this guy named David Armbeck, and uh, he did take a plea deal. Um, it was sexual assault on a uh, girl. It was I think I believe fourteen. I don't have the information right in front of me, but uh, uh, he did take a plea deal to get a lesser deal um and then to not be on the registry uh which is great his defense in court was that he was too drunk to remember yeah so yeah so um and i'm trying to put myself so i i'm a parent and i've got a daughter she's 16 now and i mean we've always watched her like a hawk like you're you're a vigilant parent you don't you know and so I'm trying to think, okay, what is the scenario under which this guy had access to that 14-year-old? Was it a slumber party at his house? Because my kind daughter of. has had slumber parties in the past. And mm-hmm. I mean, I'm there as a protector to think that I'm going to touch alcohol or like, I can't, it's so beyond inconceivable to me, yeah, like anything about this. Even the plea deal yep. just sounds like so, like you're just digging the grave worse. Yeah. He even created his own website to defend himself that you can go check out online. Um, but yeah, I believe it was his daughter had one of her friends over and that was the problem. Uh, he got too drunk to remember. So there you have it. Um, when we started to go yeah, through still, this. This guy's still, guy still teaching jujitsu. He still has access to kids. He's got three schools. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and he's still flying the Hickson flag, just FYI. Now, Hickson has kicked him out of the Global Jiu-Jitsu Federation, or is it Jiu-Jitsu Global Federation? I can't remember one of those. He's uh, since kicked him out of there. But when when this happened, you know, um, uh, there was some articles written because I called Hickson a fraud because I figured you can't hold these ideas about moral compass and have the sexual predator at your house and promote him to black belt and his degrees and all that stuff. It just does, you know, there's a... Uh, well, I saw that video uh, you did, and, and you didn't – I wouldn't say that you called him a fraud. You said that his behavior, that he's looking yeah. – it's looking like he's a fraud if this is the stance he's taking. Right. I told him to set me straight. That was the whole right. video. I was like, please, Hickson, set me straight. Trust me. I don't want to be right about this thing. You know, I want him to set me straight. And so Hickson didn't call me, but Pedro Sauer did. Mm-hmm. And um, I had many conversations with – Professor Pedro Sauer over the course of like two or three weeks, like every day. Um, And I released a second video because I told him, I was like, hey, listen, they've got to make a statement about this and they've got to kick this guy out. And if they don't and they need, I'm going to drop another bomb on you guys. And so what happened was, is that when I was going after the information and just it wasn't just me by the way it was brandon hetzler and henry akins both helped me with this and but, henry um, is hickson's guy i mean that's it doesn't so get brandon. closer than that yeah that's right Hick, oh henry has more time with hickson than anybody on the planet even yeah. hickson's kids don't have as much rolling time with hickson as henry does yeah. so um yeah so and henry wouldn't just make those accusations up i mean you know, if anybody knows anything about jujitsu, it's just something you, you you try to never make your instructor look bad about anything. Yeah, and he yeah. wasn't trying to do that. He went to Hickson many times about it and just got, you know, nothing. And so um, I think that just shows what kind of character Henry has, because when it comes down to doing the right thing, bar nothing, he's going to do the right thing. And that's do you think why some think of it from Hickson's perspective um, is maybe a cultural thing because in different, I, I grew up, I kind of off and on in Mexico when I was a kid and mm. age, age of consent is lower. I know of a woman that That's was right. 15, she was 15 and she married a 30 something year old man. And, you know, those things are common down there. And I don't know much about Brazilian culture from that perspective, but, you know, I wonder yeah. if from Hickson's perspective, he's like, oh, you know, it's just kind of a different culture. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. And Pedro said that. Pedro, actually, we talked about that quite a bit. And Pedro Sauer said that, you know, it was a different time back then. The machismo culture of Brazil was very macho and mm. kind of misogynistic, you know. And so there was a lot of things that they were trying to get through. And to their credit, um, they did try to make some changes. Pedro Sauer and Henner and Hidon Gracie 
because they were kind of marrying up doing some of the same things with the CT C groups. Mm -hmm. And um, they went and made sure that now all instructors have background checks. Mm -hmm. Even all students in a CTC get checked for sexual assault, which I think is great. Um, they also put cameras in all of the schools that were certified training centers, which I think is also great. So that way you have documented proof if anything goes on in your academy. And it, it just helps keep honest people honest. And uh, the problem is, is that once we got after, when we went after David Armbeck, other people started to pop up. People started sending me information about other people. And that's when the, the information about Homo Lobatos got brought up. And Homo Lobatos is... Kind of one of Hickson's right hand men, and he was. And to to in, be clear, uh, it's not Homolu Bahal, it's Homolu Baros, because I think when, right. when I saw that, I, I misread right. it. I thought, really? But no, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Brazilian names kind of sound, there's some that sound exactly the same. But, uh, but yeah, he's in Hawaii and whatever, and he had some sexual assault charges on him and stuff, too. And so they eventually, again, Hickson and Pedro, whatever, did the right things and kind of got these guys at least at face value out of their groups. Now, whether they're still like friends and hanging out and doing jujitsu together, I, you know, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not going to try to speculate on anything, but um, mm. I'm just happy that they took a stance against teaching and keeping sexual predators in their association or federation or whatever. I think that's what, I don't believe that if you, I believe that jujitsu is the great reformer. And whatever you've done in your past is your past, and you can be reformed from just about anything, especially mm -hmm. via the medium of jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu is such a great a tool for that kind of stuff. But sexual misconduct is not one of them. As far as, like, hurting kids or uh, raping people, I think that you should be just out. Well, Go it's take an up, interesting like, thing. I mean, or something. I mean, we know that the recidivism rate of, of sexual predators is sky high. You know, and so can you be reformed? I mean, that's an open question, I guess. And yeah, maybe but is that but a risk we're willing to take? Right, but that's the risk. It's like, okay, you've been you're a jewel thief. You went to prison because you you like stealing diamonds, but we're still going to let you work in the jewelry store. Is that a risk that's acceptable? And I, and I think you're right. I think, I mean, we're talking about kids here. We're talking about human beings that if we don't advocate for them who will advocate if their parents aren't or we as a society or we as their their teachers uh i mean even if yeah. we exclude someone who did screw up but that's a that's a big screw up man i again i keep i tr i always try to put myself in the mind of that person and that that is just something i can't even get there i can't even get close to that i can get to someone who okay he was down on his luck he he stole some money or, you know, those kinds of stories, you can have a little empathy. Okay. Maybe there's a circumstance there, but to, right. you know, fondle a kid, your, your daughter's friend. I mean, that's just the, le the, the lack of self-control, profound lack of self-control. Um, I mean, on every level, it's just hideous. So I think yeah. you're right. I think there should just be a zero tolerance policy. And I, I also think that a lot of people who are fundamentally broken are drawn to the martial arts because it's a way, sometimes it's a way to fix the things that are wrong with them. But I do think some people get into the martial arts because it gives them access and it gives them power. Um, you know, predators go where the prey is. I'm always suspicious of like nonprofit organizations that are devoted to children, right? Now, some of them are great, I'm sure. But right. there was that famous one called Save the Children, I think it was, that had, you know, commercials all over TV back in the day and actors and actresses, you know, fundraising yep. for them. And the guy that ran that organization was a massive pedophile, you know, yeah. or, or the scandals we've seen in Olympic sports with Olympic gymnastics or, you know, predators go where the prey is. So I'm, I'm always suspicious. Any man who is overly enthusiastic about working with kids, my, you know my senses go up. Um, yeah. And again, I'm not impugning everybody, but we have to be vigilant. And so I think there is a percentage of, of guys out there that become martial artists, that they do it because they want access. I know of a Taekwondo instructor that I think he went to prison as well because of inappropriate conduct. So these guys, they funnel themselves yeah. into a way that ha have access. So has that been your perspective as well? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's the path of least resistance and predators go to where they can be have the most security. And I mean, how much more security do you want if you're a black belt 
uh, that owns a school, for example. I mean, and you teach all the cops in town. Yeah. I mean, that's scary. In fact, you know, you know I have a uh, email out now that um, because I'm getting ready to do this documentary and stuff, and so we're trying to gather information and listening to survivors' stories and stuff. If, if by the way, if anybody wants to email me, that's uh, Exposing BJJ Predators at gmail.com. Feel free to email us. Tell us your story. Um, if you don't want anybody ever hear the story, that's fine too. If you want to actually, so, so be tell in the me some of those stories. I mean, don't free. name names, but just what are some of the things that well, you've got? Here's something there? that's scary that's going on. There's a trend of mm, serial um, groomers who are grooming children from a very early age and then starting a sexual relationship with them really early, like 14, 15. And, uh, so and what do you mean by grooming? They, they cross certain lines, but not too far. How, what, what do you mean? Yeah, by they, they have, they get them in this, this, they start taking class, say at the age of nine or 10, the teacher starts to tell them uh, what, how great they are and builds this relationship with them. And then at one point, it'll switch to being like, oh, I'm having trouble with my wife. And then the next thing you know, this girl is in a relationship with this instructor who has groomed them to feel like it's okay. And, um, and later on, they don't even see that it's not okay until later. And they look back and they were like, oh, no, what, what have I done? And then they feel like they're at fault because um, – the guy makes them feel like it was consensual between them. And here's the thing for all you guys out there that are thinking it was consensual between you and the 15, 14 year old, their brains are not fully formed yet. They mm. cannot make good rational decisions on their own. And even if you think it's consensual, you are taking advantage of a child and they're never going to get that back. Whether you're reformed or not, they're never going to get that back. Their family's never going to get that time back. They're scarred for life. And you know, that's why I feel like that you shouldn't be on a mat anymore. You should go do like, paper airplanes or scuba without any scuba gear. I don't care anything, but not jujitsu. So are these people that are reaching out to you? Are they naming names or, or is there yeah. a, a way to bring these people to justice? Are you guys working oh, yeah. on that? Oh yes, sir. Hmm. Yeah. I have a, luckily I have a very good um, legal team that is helping me vet everything. Cause again, with anything, you're going to get false positives, too, where people maybe are yeah. falsely accused or um, somebody's just mad at somebody, so they make an accusation about something. So you can't go off a of hearsay. You have to go yeah. off of legal documented proof. And then, you know, then it's just about exposing them and letting the world make their own decisions. You know, it's the free market, I guess. And so um, that's kind of what we're doing. And... We're in the process of putting this documentary together. We're just now doing all the legwork and groundwork on it. Um, it's only really even been an idea for maybe a month, you know, and it's just because there was a guy here in Oklahoma that um, was on a sexual registry list, and he uh, told the community, in fact, Girls and Geese, because my wife had a Girls and Geese event at their academy, and they somebody said, hey, he's on a sexual registry list, and they told us that that was with his wife. The Benton family, Eric and Tamara Benton, he said that it was his wife that that was the charge on and he got together with her when they were very young and they ran away to an Indian reservation and her dad is the one that pressed charges on them. Well, come to find out that was a lie. He had an uh, aggravated sexual assault from a, I believe it was like 14 or 15 year old or maybe 15 to 16 year old. I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly. I have the documentation somewhere in here. But uh yeah, it was fondling a child, and he did prison time over it. And it was not his wife that this happened with. It was a child. And so they just constantly moved from Kansas and opened up shop here. And then, you know, it, it was hard for people to find out, and they told this lie to cover up everything. And the turnover rate in jiu-jitsu is so high, as you probably know. It's all yeah. like white belts and blue belts mainly. And so they don't know. They're going there. They think, well, this is a black belt. He's got his own school. We must be good to go. He was teaching kids classes when he shouldn't have been. He, I mean, it was just yeah. a, a inappropriate across the board. And so one of the things that I started doing was I started going to the people that had black belted these people that were on the sexual registry list and stuff like that. Eddie Ricardo is the guy that black belted uh, Eric, and he runs Cobra BJJ out of Dallas. And so um, I reached out to him through over pandemic through private texts and stuff. And I've known Eddie Ricardo for, I don't know, a better part of 20 years, probably just through tournaments, jujitsu, you know, and I used to be a Carlos Machado guy. And I reached out to him 
a bunch. Other people reached out to him a bunch, told him the information. I think Leo Vieira also reached out to him about it too. Hmm. Somebody was saying the other day. But anyway, um, he just he basically said, oh, Eric's not really teaching any classes. He works at a dent car place or whatever. And so I sent him pictures of him promoting Eric to black belt and giving him his degrees on his black belt. And I was like, do you think this is okay? He's like, you know, obviously on the sexual registry for a reason. I showed him the information about how he, had, you know, fondled a kid. Yeah. And then he just kind of ghosted me. And this is very common that when I tell somebody information about it, they they freeze up, I guess, maybe. And they don't want to have any con conversation with me at all. And that's when I typically put them on Facebook. And I've got around 5,000 people on Facebook, and I've got a bunch of other social media platforms or whatever. And so if you won't um, discuss it with me privately, I'll make you do it publicly. Wow. And so as soon as I did that, he kicked him out of the association, got you know banned him from their group and all of his schools and stuff, which should have happened four years ago, really. But um, but yeah, we're, I think now I've had enough time to really think about it. In the beginning, when this first happened four years ago, I was really blown away by it. I'm like, you know, I just... I didn't want to believe that this was an actual problem that was happening. I thought it was just some sort of weird anomaly. Yeah. And we're such a self-regulating martial art anyway, right? Yeah. If somebody gets a fake black belt, oh, we're there outing him on camera. We write articles about it. A kid gets a blue belt when he's 15. The whole world goes nuts, right? It's a million articles about it. But yeah. yet we've got this guy who's fondling a kid uh, who's running not just a school but an association. You know, he's got his own little multiple schools and stuff. Mm -mm, no. No, nah, it rubs me the wrong way, man. And I, again, I don't think that they should be allowed to to do jujitsu. And, so and that's not even my real personal beliefs about it, which my personal beliefs don't mean anything. All we can do is what is legal, and we want to make sure that parents know who yeah. these predators are and that they're safe. You know. And so. what do you think is the ultimate solution here? It, should there be an organization that where parents can go to and look people up, or I mean, what? What what is well, your ultimate goal here with with all this yeah, stuff? I'm glad you asked because in the documentary right now as it stands the way I've got it kind of setting in my mind is that it'll be kind of three parts. The first part will be more exposing the predators that are out there that have a criminal record that we can physically see, and uh, maybe even trying to get um, them to speak on camera. I might track them down in some places and see what we get. Um, and I'm willing to hear, like, if somebody's been wrongly accused of something or whatever, that's part of the story. Let's 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 have a conversation about this. And the second part of the uh, documentary will be about the survivors and being able to tell their stories. I'm sure that it will ruffle some feathers and probably shine a light on a few people. Uh, and then the third part, the third part's really what you're getting at. Like, what can we actually do about this? Because you feel pretty helpless when you start hearing all these stories. You know, there's that well, belt checker website where it's sort of crowdsourced, where it, people vet mm -hmm. black belts. I'm In my mind, I, I immediately started thinking of something like that could be used. Yeah, for. that's cool. But you know who who goes to those things? Black and brown belts. Those are the ones that care. The new person just doesn't even know there's a belt checker, whatever. They're just like yeah. bringing their kid to a school, yeah. you know. So what really needs to change is the culture our jujitsu culture. Now uh, we can say whatever about just normal culture around us or whatever. I can't do have much of an effect on that. But schools are directly affected by the top. Whoever is at the top is uh, affecting the whole group. So if somebody's having like mm, locker room talk or whatever and it's inappropriate, um, but it's just the boys, you know, back there. I tell them I don't think that it's appropriate. People know how I feel about that kind of stuff because I want to create an environment yeah. where women and children feel safe. Yeah. And um, same thing for Henner and Hedon and a lot of these guys who run large associations. If they set the example, then people will follow suit. I mean, you know, jiu-jitsu is kind of a cult. And we strive to be like our... Um, people that we put on these pedestals like Hickson or whatever, right? So if these people like Hickson and Pedro Sauer and Henner and Hedon and um, Hodge or Gracie and all these people come out and, and really set the tone for what they believe should be a real martial artist environment, then I think that's part of what will 
save us in the in the long run. The other thing is making parents aware that they need to be doing their due diligence with background checking people. Now, this doesn't mean going to do like a background check that costs a lot of money to find out everything in somebody's past, but yeah. you can look at a sexual offenders registry for free in most states. And so or, or here's that's one the too. thing. I mean, when my son, uh, he's a jujitsu purple belt now, but when he was young, there was no jujitsu there. So we put him in Taekwondo when he was real young. And either me or my wife were always there watching class. I mean, just stuff like that where you're like, listen, I don't know this guy. I'm not going to drop my kid off and then go pick him up a couple hours later. He's probably fine. But, yeah, you know, you just have to be vigilant as a parent. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of this stuff doesn't actually happen at the academy. It's because the, the instructor has been grooming this person for so long. And then the parents start to feel very comfortable because this is coach and he's been helping my daughter out for so long and he's just such a great example and blah 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 you you just saw this with the whole fight sports thing that just happened right um i don't know if i can pull that up right here or not i should have had more information ready but um she was groomed by her instructor and she thought nothing of it and they went to a tournament where um it was like fight to win or whatever and the night before the tournament, he was like, oh, I forgot my sleeping pills. I'm going to just get some wine. I'll just get some wine and go to sleep. No big deal. And then, you know, they get into the hotel or whatever, and he's like, oh, come over and let's watch the fights tonight. And then one thing led to another, like, oh, I'll just have a glass of wine. And then he sexually assaults her, you know, mm. and makes it feel like it's her fault because she wanted it or whatever, you know. And it's like that's where it gets tricky, you know. And so – you know, I, I don't trust anybody when it comes to just about anything. But yeah. I think parents, because a lot is going on, maybe you've got several kids, there's life, there's my job, there's pandemic, all sorts of things you have to think about, right? And so you're used you, to dropping you your kids off at school, or you're used to them going at stuff after right? school, and it just becomes this thing, yeah. And that guy should be the guy that's trying to protect your kids, right? He's trying to empower them. You know, our motto at my school is we empower the weak against the strong, the child against the bully, and the woman against the violent man. And I think most people kind of try to use that vibe as a selling point. Yeah. But, um, but man, you, you just got to be you got to be extra cautious. I don't personally have any children of my own. Me and my wife, we have a dog, but um, it terrifies me, and I don't have any kids at all. So I can only imagine having a daughter uh, you know these days and age i would just be uh i would be hyper vigilant for sure and yeah, we've parents shouldn't been, be able to feel okay about it you shouldn't you know, feel bad that been, you're going to do that we've always been hyper vigilant with our kids and it just seems like the normal thing to do why wouldn't you be they're your kids it's your job to shield them from the bad things that can happen and you can't entirely obviously kids need to learn to fail and that's a different sure. subject but but um, when we're talking about potential abuse, of course, and you, you mentioned a minute ago the culture at the gym, I think that's really important too. There was a, a gym that, you know, I, I wanted to get my daughter involved in jujitsu. Um, I was living somewhere else and man, these guys, they would always play like really filthy rap music with all the F-bombs and all that. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to bring my daughter in here. I'm just not going to bring her in here. And so I've always tried in my environment, I've got the you know, the language filter on, on iTunes. And, you know, I've just, I try to keep it a, a clean environment so anybody can feel comfortable there. Maybe you're a Christian, maybe you're a whatever. I don't, I don't care who you are training, yeah. but I just want you to feel like you're, you're good there because this is our job to empower people, not to make people feel like, um, oh man, it's locker room talk in that place or, or whatever. And I'm, I'm with you too. It's like, we're going to keep this place clean. What you do on your, on your own is your business. And I'm no saint either on my own, but in that environment, we keep it absolutely above board. Yeah. It's just being professional. I mean, you can't go to any other job in, in as a public, as a public service job and do crazy yeah. stuff like that. So why should this be any different? In fact, it should be, you should be more professional in this environment than anywhere else because what is it, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. We've all heard that a million times, but it's true. It's mm -hmm. it's true. So um, when is this documentary going to be out? Well, we don't have a set date for it or anything right now. We're just compiling all the information for it. Um, 
I'm probably eventually going to do a GoFundMe uh, to get, you know, the right kind of... It takes a lot to do documentaries, unfortunately. Now, I've got some great videographer friends of mine. I do videography also, so um, we can do it on a shoestring budget. And I've also had a ton of people reach out to me that want to financially help and stuff like that. So maybe not. We maybe won't have to do that. Right now, we're not even to that point. Right now, it's just gathering the information um, and trying to sift through all the stuff because there's a lot of stuff. A lot of people are sending me things that, unfortunately, um, because it's just... It's not documented, and um, there's not a lot you can do with some of that stuff. And a lot of, like, hearsay type stuff. Yeah, you have to be careful yourself you know? as well. Yeah. Because yeah, there's so, potential. Correct. I don't want to have too many wrongful lawsuits. We're going to get sued regardless. You can sue over anything. I could sue you today for burning down my house, and you have to go to court and prove that you didn't do it. So a lawsuit is not that hard to file, but um, it will be hard to make it stick if I do my – you know, due diligence. So um, that's what we're doing. I've got a great legal team that's supporting me on all this. I wouldn't have started any of this without that legal team. Um, mm -hmm. They're very, very supportive and backing me 100% on that. And the other thing is like, here's the one thing that I've noticed. A lot of people want to do something, but they don't want to have their name attached to it because maybe mm -hmm. the guy is in their town. They don't want to be the guy that out of the guy in their town because then it's, they got a target on them. Yeah. And me and my wife have talked about this quite a bit. There, There is a little bit of physical risk that may come with this and we're pretty prepared for that kind of stuff we're we're pretty vigilant on stuff like that anyway mm -hmm. and then of course legally people will there'll be some lawsuits i'm sure filed and stuff like that but again we are prepared for that um we don't have any children so we're not putting any children at risk for anything yeah. like that um my school is very very secure so um and we have people constantly watching for anybody that might come in that was weird or whatever and when kids' classes are there, we have, you know, doors are locked and stuff. So it's a fairly safe environment, I feel like. We have a lot of cops that are there constantly, you know, training and stuff. So, um, so yeah, I feel like if we have to put um, a face on it to be able to get people to pay attention to it, then I don't mind being that face. It's not yeah. my ultimate goal in life, but it's something that I feel passionate about. I feel like that... Sometimes you got to do the right thing, regardless of who it upsets, what boat it rocks. It's just it's how it is. Yeah. Well, I, I applaud you for what you're doing, and and you just hit the nail on the head that so many people would would say, "Hey, that's a cool cause," but man, you know, that's going to be take a lot of guts to put my name out there. So it definitely takes some guts, and I applaud you for that. Give me the the email address again, where where people can can send you information if they want to contact. Yeah, you. if you um if you have information about somebody that's training at a school near you or at your school, or if you're a survivor of sexual assault um, at the hands of a BJJ practitioner or coach, feel free to reach out to us at exposingbjjpredators at gmail .com. Um, I get back with you as quick as I can. I've got a lot of emails coming in, so I try to, at night, go through them all and get back to everybody at night after classes and stuff. But, um, but yeah, if you are a survivor, um, just know that you're not alone. I know a lot of people feel like they've been silenced, and there's a bunch of people that are sticking up for the guy and all this kind of stuff. But just know, there's a bunch of us out here that um, are going to stand up and do the right thing, and we've got your back. Yeah. Well, I'm, I appreciate you you coming on the podcast today, Ty. Let, let's keep in touch on this, and sure. as as this documentary unfolds, maybe we can reconvene and, and talk about it a little more because it's such an important topic. And man, I applaud you your efforts again. And, and if you're in Oklahoma, no better place to train than than Red Line. My instructor Roy Dean has been down there teaching seminars, and that's how you came onto my radar originally. And I know you yeah, run a great, great academy. Uh, you've been doing this a long time. You're you're a really killer martial artist, very skilled, and uh, a very good teacher too. From what I've seen from your clips on YouTube, so can't recommend your environment enough. So, thanks again. Thank you, I, I appreciate it, man. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Uh, okay, sounds good. Talk soon.